The sentence for this kind of offense is that you shall be hanged till you die. It's a horrifying experience. The thing was so terrifying that I couldn't look at them for a while. I quickly entered into the cell because I knew that they had come for me. A placement for about 23 inmates now hosts over 150 inmates. No president wants to sign for them to be killed. Personally, it's been against my conscience to take life, no matter what. Uh, because uh, if you like the, uh, an influence religiously, to know that it's only God that should take life. But the gallows are still intact. A weight must be put on you so that you are not and that you don't go through unnecessary pains. The first one and then I think it ends. Death row and the sad realities associated. I am Seth Kwame Boatin. Join me as I take you to the condemned block of the Nsawa Medium Security Prisons to appreciate the thin line between freedom and death. group of prisoners with their musical instruments playing and singing gospel songs. happening right inside the special block of the Nsawa medium security prisons, popularly known as the condemned block. Inmates here have been sentenced to death. They are to be executed and that can happen even in the next minute. Probably this song is what will do the trick for them to forever shut the mind of the president from signing their death warrant. Death is all they see around them, so they resort to singing most of the time to take their minds off it. Basically, we're the condemned prisoners. Patrick Dakumisa says the population here keeps increasing. Currently, we have 152 male prisoners. Then the female session we have six. So in totality we have 158 uh, condemned prisoners in the country. All these 158 prisoners were pronounced guilty of murder after their trial by courts of competent jurisdiction. As punishment for their crimes, they must also be killed. This is consistent with Article 3, Clause 1 of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana, which states that no person shall be deprived of his life intentionally except in the exercise of the sentence of a court in respect of a criminal offence under the laws of Ghana of which he has been convicted. Every sane person is responsible and answerable for the natural and probable consequences of his actions. I mean, same person, anybody who has got his senses by himself, not a madman and the rest of them, or drunkard and things like that. Meet former Supreme Court Judge Justice Stephen Alambrobe. He says the law applies this to the latter. The same way you cause the loss of the life of the person who is dead, the society requires that you also suffer the same exit from life, so to speak that we impose on the other party because, as I said, everybody's entitled to his life and liberty and, and, and a right to live. And you have no right to take away his life. So, so once, once, it's, once the jurors find mm -hmm. that you are guilty, society requires that the same way that you cause somebody to lose his life, you also have to 
lose your life. So I'm moving to the special block where we have a number of uh, inmates who are on death row. They don't know when they will be killed. Their anxiety levels are just too much. I understand some have exhibited so, so much remorse and they wish they could go home. I am being accompanied by the Eastern Region Prisons Commander, Deputy Director of Prisons, Isaac Ejiri. He knocks on the fortified Ayong Gate securing the condemned block and it is opened. Life virtually ends here. Dreams are shattered immediately you are marched to this block. The scary sounds of death is all you hear ringing in your ears every second. Sadly, a greater percentage of these condemned prisoners are very young. Some are below 30 years. <laughs> 23-year-old Abdul Halik Hamza is one of the prisoners. He can be killed through hanging anytime. I find him in a small makeshift mosque made for them in the condemned block. This is where Halik consoles himself anytime it dawns on him that he killed and he must also be killed. The Quran is his companion. Sadly, his journey into the condemned block started right after reading his Quran and offering his Maghrib prayers on 13 July 2013 in Tamale, the northern regional capital. It was in a fasting season when we about to break our fasting. So I left with my friends to the Nyohani roundabout to get to get some food and break our fasting. When we got there, we met some other group there. So we, we sit with them and we sat with them and we were conversing. So after that, I was left with, with one of my friends to take some key password with him that he was changed in my, this thing, in my computer. So I was there with the friend when I, when I heard noise. The people were shouting there. Actually, when I came back, when I came back, I asked what, happened, what, what is going on here. And they said some guys came and said they are going to beat them. That is what I heard. So I was telling them to stop. They were shouting and they were all, all taking things. They were, they, were, they, were, they were just fighting. So I was telling them to stop. Truth, the, truth stop, stopping them, I take, I, I take some stick, some wood, to see what I can do that to separate them so that everybody will move there. But being in this thing, through this separation, I had one with the stick and he fell down. It was not a normal fall. His victim, Abdul Kanu, did not die immediately. He was quickly rushed to the Tamale Teaching Hospital and Halek was immediately whisked away to the police station by a police patrol team who chanced on the incident. Abdul, unfortunately, did not survive. He died the next day. That morning, one also came to me. One of my friends came to me and said, the person who is okay, now he's even talking. Literally, getting to around 10 or 9, when another person also came and told me that the person is normal. And that time, <laughs> that time, I've never met that thing before. And I've never think of it. So that time, I may confuse. Because how can a human being lose in life through in your hands? So that time, I was even confused. I was in the cells, and they told me to eat. And I said, no, I can't eat. This is what is going on. And what is going on, that thing, I've never seen some before. So I can't live with it. And they told me I should be patient. This, is, this one, it is not my fault. But God knows why. That is why they... That's what my friends in the cell told me.
but I thought it was just a dream. So when they come and announce this to me, in fact, <laughs> I was. Did you cry? I cried a lot. And even three days self, I do not eat. Three days. When they were brought food, my people brought food and said they are on date. And I said, not they are on date, that I'm, that I'm checking. I'm, what happened? What happened? What really happened? And that's, that, that, that is what I'm thinking of. But not you are on, the, you, you are on date. So what exactly happened to Abdul after he was hit with a stick? I have come to Tamale to find out more. In the Attorney General's office here in Tamale, I am handed a dossier of documents on Halek, including his first charge sheet on 16 July 2013, his response and other statements from the investigators. Halek admits in his statement to the police that indeed he hit his victim with a piece of wood. He, however, kept stressing the fact that it was not premeditated. I checked the next paper, and there is the autopsy report answering my question on why 27-year-old Abdul Kanil died. The autopsy was done on 17 July 2013, two days after his death. The forensic pathologist with the Tamale Teaching Hospital, Dr. Edmond Dea Muni, states in this report that Abdul suffered severe head injury, massive scalp hematoma, that is a solid swelling of clotted blood with the tissues and multiple skull fractures as well as blunt trauma. Per the autopsy report, all this happened because of the piece of wood Abdul was hit with. Halik got to know later that he was even related to his victim. He was a member of his extended family that he didn't know. The autopsy report paved the way for Halek to be tried. The trial took three years. Halek had high hopes he would escape any form of long custody because he had maintained over and again that he did not intentionally kill. On 11 July 2016, the opposite happened. Halek's worst fear happened to him. Caught. They have a seven people called juries. They have to go and gather the listing before the judge can pass his judgment. So I was in the box when the, when, they, when the judge said they should go and vote. They went and voted and came back and said, this is the matter. And the judge too said, they said you are guilty of the offense. So me too, I agree with them. And he asked me that, that whether I have something to say. And I said, no, because how, how it was come. Because he said, these people have agreed that I'm guilty of the offense. I have nothing to do again. And that time too, sir, <laughs> that time. <laughs> In fact, I was very aback. That time, when he just said, I sentence you to death death sentence condemned by hanging <laughs> what I was I was I was really feeling something different like I what? thought I thought <laughs> I don't that, that time I, I, I didn't even feel myself in the court there is a reason the jurors and the judge retired to their closets to consult as happened in the case of Halleck as former Supreme Court judge Justice Stephen Alan Brube explains in the murder cases I was in the as I said, for some years, in murder cases, the charges are prepared. They are prosecuted by the prosecutor. Usually, murder cases are by lawyers or senior, very senior state attorneys or police officers. Evidence is laid, and then at the end of the trial, the judge sums up the law and the evidence to the jurors. That is the difference. And then after, after summing up the law and the evidence to the jurors, they retire and consider whether the person is guilty or not guilty on the basis of the law and the evidence as summed up by the, by the judge. Now, if they are unanimous that the person is guilty of murder, when they return to the courtroom and they announce the verdict of guilty of murder 
against the accused person. The judge has no option but just to say, then the sentence for death in this country by law is that you are to be killed or hanged, period. So it's the jurors who decide whether or not the person is guilty. And the judge merely pronounces what the jurors decide and it goes on to impose sentence. The sentence is tied up on the conviction. So the role So the role the judge plays at this point is just announcing the decision of the jurors. Yet when it goes bad or when the wrong judgment is given, most often the judges are those who face the anger of the public. It's not easy because sometimes if the jurors make a mistake, you, you can have I've had situations where the evidence was so overwhelming that I expected the jurors to come up with the verdict of guilty. And they came out not guilty. And they reduced uh, the crime and the offense to manslaughter. Now, in a situation like that, I go home with sleepless nights because I get worried that what has been done is wrong. But that's the law. I have no have any authority to change it. And if you change it, the state attorney goes on appeal, you will be ridiculed. I'm not going to do that. And if you change it, you mean flying in the face of the law, which I'm not allowed to do. So, or the other way around, sometimes the jurors find the person guilty. And you know in your heart and mind that this man should not be found guilty. And they say he's guilty then you have to pronounce it. But on the other way around, they say, he's not guilty. And you know he's guilty. And then you just have to pronounce that he's not guilty. Being on death row is depressing not only for the people condemned to die, but also for the hundreds of relatives and friends who care about them. I was thinking they said he's not guilty. Before we could hear that he's guilty. I even fell down and then my brother took me out. And I said, we, know, we don't know that this will come. Why did you fall? Well, during that time, I thought they would come out with, without guilty. This is Halek's father, Al Hassan Masahudu. I managed to establish contact with him he works at a small block manufacturing house here in Tamale. Mr. Masahudu says he is the saddest father on earth today. He still cannot believe his son could be killed anytime. We know really that if they are asked to be killed, he will be among them. Because he was very dead to be killed. So we know he will be killed. It's in the house. It's in the house. Halik's family is spending fortunes to hire good lawyers as they appeal the death sentence. His father wishes the president can do something about Halek's case. I will tell the president that for the sake of Almighty God, should help him to also help us for our child to be released to us so that we know how to take care of him and then he also end up, up with his living very well. Yeah. So then I should pardon your son? We pray to him to pardon him. We pray to him to pardon him for us. Because this is not his habit.